so you can see the, the burst of words here. Florencia Sanchez has waited for the child who left and never came back and has shoveled dirt onto the grave of the son who sold his soul and that of his people for a few miserable pesos. The one who moved up and up until he finally rose so high that he no longer remembered Florencia Sanchez. The root of all roots, the old woman, the witch, the angel, the lady selling beans or kneading tortillas, the wise farmer, seared by innumerable tragedies, the priestess, door, vessel, pitcher, griddle, gate to heaven, window on hell, the open wound, mother of blind Indians, grandmother to a thousand half-dead children, sister of hens, healer with, kitten, with chicken droppings, untiring worker, emaciated, emaciated seamstress at Van Piros and Company, textile mill, wife of Pablo Jaguar, oldest daughter of the legendary grandfather, Salo, with a sundial of fruit, a ring of lianas, the fragrance of nopal and a dress of ashes, <clears throat> the repository of all the injustices the unjust have decreed to justify their hate, their crucifix of crossed rifles. Florencia Sanchez, old as the first night of time, she who knows how to wait behind the door while putting up with the dirty tricks of history, the outrages, blows, insults, and false glow of the land of smiles. It might be said that I have invented you, or that you are another of my great plagiarisms from other more original sources. It might be said that, it, it might be said, but you and I know that you are real and are made of flesh and bone, Florencia Sanchez. So, in the words of Ortega y Gasset, Esplendor y miseria de la traducción. <laughs> Quijar Urias' most completely neo-baroque work, however, is undoubtedly his novel, Lujuria Tropical, published in San Salvador in 1997. The only book-length work of its kind in Latino-Canadian literature. Lujuria Tropical is a pin to art, specifically music, as well as the sensuality and the eternal feminine, all of which are embodied in the central character, Lulu, who is a singer of everything from aves to opera, but above all, boleros. The sentences are alternately fragmented or unstoppable, filled with a descriptive dynamism much like incantation that piles image upon image in a lexical exhilaration characterized by the pure pleasure of painting portraits and scenes with words, lianas and vines of words that twine around axes of perception in a sort of vegetable, or in a sort of vegetal Baroque universe. <clears throat> the plot of the novel turns around Lulu's relations with a series of lovers that include a painter, who almost immediately commits suicide, a composer teacher, El Maestro, a poet and observer, the narrator himself, a demanding general, uh, and a demanding general, but the work is fundamentally a series of prose tableaux, of outlandishly profuse portraits in which the narrator revels in giving in completely to the profligacy of words that only dies down when every imaginable epithet and adjective has been exhausted. So you read these, these sections and you're caught up in this, this tremendous onrush and it lifts you on, it's like a wave, and then finally when he can't invent anymore, he can't take these, these constantly growing vines, verbal vines out any farther, it kind of lapses and then it's the next section. But there's, there's almost no really a real plot movement or uh, anything of the kind. He decided to just enjoy what he was doing. The work is also playfully referential to its own neo-baroqueness, with allusions to un concierto barroco, un instante de lucidez barroca, el mismo palimpsesto, el pintor Lucas Cranach, who seems to travel through time in order to come back and paint Lulu. References to Severo Sarduy and José Donoso, and also a Haitian colonel, Alexis Sandra, qui vive Shango, who wants to purify Lulu through a voodoo ceremony. Interesting also the idea of uh, the neo-baroque and voodoo. 
Throughout, the speaker constantly plays with language, inventing popular nicknames, and Guijardo Rios is an expert at this, characters known as El Papagayo, El Gran Perseguidor, Luna Mar, Carita de Rata, Little Rat Face, y El Turco Yala, twisting words into new combinations, such as Voodoo, combination of Buddhism and Voodoo, Voodoo, and, and uh, so, the police being in a prefectura and a prefactura, and seasoning the whole wild salad with indigenous regional terms and erudite expressions interspersed again like cultismos that constantly alter and transform the register. In just a couple of lines. This is from the first chapter. Cantaba. Y a medida que cantaba se convertía en ave, en pájara de vistoso plumaje. Ningunas alas como aquellas. Plumas, las más diversas, tonas soladas, verdes, plumas del ave de paraíso, plumas de pavo real, de guacamaya y de tucán, plumas con los colores del paraíso, plumas de todos los ángeles y arcángeles que conforman el coro de Santa Cecilia. Again, this use of repetition is an incantation. The Neo-Baroque, then, is, a vibrantly is vibrantly alive within the writing of Canadians from Latin America and the Caribbean, whether it be in the work of a single major author, such as Quijado Diaz, or that of a number of writers working within a larger tradition, such as the Haitian Canadians. Though its impact is limited on the Spanish side, only two of Quijado Diaz's books of short stories have been translated, neither of them written in the Neo-Baroque style, and hasn't yet affected mainstream authors in Canada, it remains entirely possible that the current fascination with Latin American writing may sometime cause Canadian writers to import something of the neo-baroque into their style, just as Robert Croach has done with magic realism. Uh, Robert Croach, who actually doesn't read in Spanish, he, he read uh, Garcia Marquez and other magic, uh, uh, magic uh, realist authors in English, but then he imported all that into his novels about, of all places, Alberta. <laughs> and uh, I mean, these novels are wonderful. They're absolutely, they're magic, they're novels of magic realism uh, set within a, uh, a Western context, a Western pre-oil context. Uh, the Neo-Baroque has already had a tremendous influence on Quebec poetry particularly on the revolutionary poets of the 1960s and 70s, such as Paul Chamberlain and the writers associated with the, rev with the review Parti Piri, who identified closely with Caribbean authors, such as Aimé Césaire and René de Peste, equating their own liberation, the liberation of Quebec, with that of the Caribbean, but also importing elements of the neo-baroque style. In, in Chamberlain's Terre Québec, you know, the whole, the whole extended metaphor of woman that he loves and, and homeland and so on is completely fused. You can see the neo-baroque uh, uh, influence there clearly. And what writer could be more, this is just a note, what writer could be more innately sui generis baroque than Hubert Aquin? As respected writers such as Anthony Phelps, Emile Olivier, Gérard Etienne, and Joël de Rosier carry the tradition forward in Quebec, its influence well perceptibly or imperceptibly spread out from them. 